First thing I want to ask is, how did you all get into this career? Well, I think that we all have different entrances. But the one thing is, I will guarantee at this table, that we always saw differently. And it wasn't that we wanted to be different. We, could be, we couldn't be the same. We saw, and as we became older and had adult voices, we needed to remember what we saw. And, and how did you specifically, like, did you, did you fall in love with costume design or were you no, started I in theater? I think that what happened for myself is that if you grow up and you're a bit different and you're very young, either you have to remember at that time that that's okay to be that way or you stop. And you remember those things and you carry them with you and you remember those that weren't as strong. And then you go to school, and in my case, I had studied many different things. And theater was a place where there was a voice, a visual voice, where you could talk about anything. But you could, when you left that theater, you knew less because the story was still happening. And I needed to be part of something, part of something that I could stand back and watch and still visually be heard. So gradually, that uh, turned into being a costume designer. But if what I do has, if, if the one thing that happens for all of us, if we can just say, look again, just look again. Be careful who you walk by. There's something more. What will make that camera dance? And it's going to be the combination of all of us on that call sheet. Um, yeah. Sort of default, I, w I wanted to do fashion uh, originally and then I had one in interview which didn't go very well and so I sort of um, was advised by um, a member of my family uh, the idea about theatrical. Who, who was your member of your family? That my mother. Really? Yeah. And uh, so a bit of nepotism and um, I got a job in a uh, costume house quite young. I was in there at 19 so that was my beginning. I was always interested in clothes and color and fashion and history of fashion and uh, you know I was in theater and was on stage but I would always do my own costumes and do sketches I can remember doing a sketch at 14 of a costume so do you remember uh, what the costume was or? yeah it was uh, James Keller in the miracle worker and uh, and then so I just continued in theater as an actor at, you know, community theater and stuff like that. And then I went to undergraduate school for theater. And I was more and more drawn to the costumes and spent a lot of time in the costume shop. And at some point there was a gradual transition to this is, this is more uh, of all the things that I love, drawing, painting, fabrics, history, than performance but luckily having been a theater major for undergraduate I know how actors need to prepare so that's that helped me to be a better costume designer I think I became a costume designer in a very kind of different way because I, I was um, I grew up in a really rural area in Washington State and I wanted to be a painter and um, I got a pregnant in high school and had a baby. And so I raised my daughter um, by working at all kinds of jobs from, you know, factory work to waitressing to all kinds of things. And then when, when she was on her feet and, and out of high school, I moved to New York. And um, I had worked at that point in Seattle in the fashion business, but more in the selling. And, and I had a consulting business for people. And I ended up starting my life again. And I, um, I uh, went to NYU to try to take a course there. And I took a summer course there in uh, film school, not knowing what it was I wanted to do in film, just being always in love with the movies, the greatest escape when you live in sort of a boring place. And um, ended up always 
on the little projects doing the clothes for some reason. And so I sort of became, I ended up sort of PAing in an art department by chance and then working in, in the art department for about a year just doing whatever I could and then starting to kind of be a runner and assistant in the costume world. And, you know, one thing leads to another. You meet great people and, you know, you learn as you go. And that's sort of my experience in costume. I found myself having finished university, having done a degree in philosophy, not really knowing what to do. And um, I had no background in costume. I didn't know anyone who worked in film or theater or anything. And I was just kind of, I, I enjoyed watching films, I enjoyed watching TV, and I enjoyed you know, playing around with clothes. And I kind of one day realized that someone did costume just by a process of deduction. <laughs> it took me quite a while. And, um, and then I didn't know what to do. And I, my mother bumped into someone who was shooting a commercial or something, and I, they said, oh, why doesn't she try working at Angels or Cosprop or one of the other costume houses in London? So that's what I did. I went and got a job at Angels, and I worked there for about two and a half years, and I kind of began to understand what the job was and met lots of people who would then help me later on, I think. Can you remember any of the ones that helped you? I mean, most, the, the, biggest per, the biggest influence on my career and the person who helped me the most, who I met while I was working at Angels, was Lindy Hemming. Mm, so wow. she's the biggest influence on my career. Yeah. Paco, how about you? Well, I, I think, you know, as somebody has said before, I started working in theatre, <clears throat> and funnily enough, as, you know, I started doing sets. And then I was working in very, very small productions, and I had to end up all the time doing the costumes as well. But I always did the costumes like, you know, like a side thing, like I didn't pay any attention to them, really. And I also thought they were, like, really easy, I thought. <laughs> and I know, I know. <laughs> and, then I ended up doing more and more costumes, and then I realized how difficult they are, you know. And uh, I think basically it's this, that, that's what happened. I, I'm, I'm doing costumes in a way because I think, you know, uh, uh, life guided me to costumes, but I wasn't really interested in them to start with. Mm, that's interesting. I was much more interested in, in, interested in, in, in sets and in painting and in drawing, mm -hmm. and then, you know, I don't know. It's like a kind of like fate somehow. I think that what we're all hearing is that to be a costume designer, you have to be interested in many things. Because, and, and you need to know those moments in history. You, you, even if you have a very strict education, you still learn from those on the street. And what happens here is that we came into costume not because we said to Santa, I want to be a costume designer, but because there were things that we were doing by ourselves, things where we, in the middle of the night, to keep going, we would have a TV on because we, we were there on this quest to keep seeing. And then you walk in to an empty theater or an empty sound stage, and you begin to see, once again, that you can be part of something. And all of us here, we're storytellers. We're storytellers and we get paid for it, which will allow us to age a little easier. Right? <laughs> We've already looked back once. <laughs> what do you think is the biggest misconception about your job as costume designer that most people have? They, they look at the screen and they think, oh, aren't those pretty clothes? And I think that's it. Is that the I misconception? I think you just said it. Yeah. You know, well, aren't so, those pretty clothes? But then, and then, so how would you explain it to I people? think um, my theory is that I think everybody gets dressed in the morning. So therefore, because everybody gets dressed pretty much, um, the, it's, it's a simple thing to do. So the application of what we do is that somehow, you know, it's channeled through that thinking. But not everybody designs a room or builds a house, so therefore, Production design is on a different. Well, explain explain for those people that don't understand it. Like, tell them what it is that you're trying to do. Well, as Julie says, we're just basically we're telling a story and we're mm -hmm. underlying the characters we're addressing. But mm -hmm. um, I think the application in that, and uh, all of us, you know, people who come to work or seen what we do, that they're amazed by the process because it's you know it's a deep and complicated and long-winded process and. Um, I don't know why it is, uh, because presumably in the 40s, it was, you know, it was more revered as a profession. Mm. And um, 
you know, everything was constructed and um, I don't know where the shift came. Where did the shift come? Did the shift come in the, like, the 60s or well, the 70s or something? I believe that what, what began to happen was it, it was a different type of realism. It wasn't that it, it was no longer that it stayed on the screen. It was that it came out of the screen and you could be part of it. You could wear it, you could buy it. And with that, the accessibility also without studio workrooms, you would find things. You wouldn't make everything. You were trained to do the sketch, but then you would find the great tie, as Mark and I talk about, with the little bit of Kleenex left on it. And you think, this has a past. The camera's going to dance. <laughs> if the actor will wear it, and the director that? will allow you. <laughs> uh, you know, I'll say that I'm a costume designer, and people will say, "Oh, that must be so much fun," <laughs> and and it, and it is fun. But I, I think what Joanna said, it, it's it's really planning and d thoughts about so many things, and and interacting with actors and directors and and now more and more ac accountants and producers mm -hmm. and, and uh, dyers and, and finding things and running out of fabric and having something held up at the border because you can't get it uh, in I, time. I had to say, yeah. I had Marlon Brando's so. suit and we didn't have the correct papers, oh. the carnies. So they took me aside and they spread out the suit. And I said to them, you know, I'm a large person. If I want to be fancy and if I want to have other people looking, so be it. And he looked at me and he said, oh my, oh my, my, you're okay. And I left. Then I got to my hotel room. I just started crying. I mean, it wasn't that big, but you have to do it. Did you, you get have the suit? To. Yes, because it was mine and I was wearing it. I had my own. But that wasn't true. It just wasn't true. But that's it. You have to, you have to love it that much. Oh, that's so funny. How about you, Paco? I think it's a lot of misconceptions. You know, a lot of people think it's a pretty job, as, you know, as we were saying. And, and I think it's one of the toughest jobs. Um, you have to pay attention to so many things. First thing, the script. Then you have to to listen what the director is saying, then the actor, then you know you have to start looking for your own inspiration, or you do that for at the very beginning, but then you have to start looking for things that you, sometimes you never find. Mm -hmm. You start like looking for a fabric that doesn't exist, but it is in your mind, you and it's the like next show, yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> and it's banging you and banging you and banging you. It has to be this fabric. That's it has to be this true. fabric. It has to be this fabric. And then one day you suddenly find something, and it might not be the fabric you wanted to find, but you get the illusion that it is the fabric. And then, <laughs> and then you start making the whole, the whole dress or the whole suit, and it doesn't behave as you thought. I mean, it's so hard. I mean, I'm a big panicker. I'm always panicking. And I suppose it's the same here. You know, I go to bed and I think, oh my God, oh my God, why did I say that fabric? Why did I say that fabric? Because you always have people like saying behind you, you have to choose now, you have to choose now, you haven't got time and things like that. Then I think it's very hard and people doesn't realize how hard it is, especially in our profession, I have to say. You know, you have to, a lot of people surrounding us that think that we are doing pretty, pretty things. Yeah. Maybe we, we should not. carry a call sheet. A call sheet that says how many jobs there are on a film and how large our department is, that we are reliant upon costume shops, uh, upon assistants, upon crew that are there every day that, that allow the consistency. I'm not so sure how good I am at continuity, but nonetheless, it's necessary. I, I think that I keep saying this, we were not meant to work by ourselves, and yet we're the front person, and some of us get hired by the director. Some of us, after a while, we all know each other. We know that, that if you hear that Joanna got Lincoln, you say, well, great, at least it's going to be done right, and then you go in your car and you go, 
I don't know how that happened, you know. <laughs> but those are private moments, you know. Right? No, we're not competitive. Yeah. I, no, I, 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 no, because at least somebody's doing it that knows how to do it. That's when you're not competitive. When you become competitive is if you wonder, how did they do that? How did they get that job, you know? Yeah. I mean, I have to believe that. If, if I, I, I believe it. Mark, do I believe it? I believe it. Yeah, yeah okay. Jacqueline, you were telling me, we were talking earlier about uh, the strange course in your career in terms of you want one film, but you get a different right. one, and then that, where that film takes you. Can you guys talk about that in your life? Yeah, I, w I was just talking specifically about how I had really wanted to be doing another movie, and I desperately wanted to get it, and I didn't get it. Wait, what was that it was The Constant Gardener. I really wanted oh. to do it, and, uh, and I was really fed up when I didn't get it. But then the next minute, it was when I met Joe and did Pride and Prejudice. So that's actually a much better movie for me to have, been, have done. And now and you've done two more films with yeah, him. Yeah, I've done two more films with him, and it's you know, a big part of my work. But it wasn't something that I was looking for. I was thinking I really wanted to be doing another job. Mm -hmm. and so you, fate just intervenes, and I think fate and luck intervene. I think. <laughs> I mean, Colleen, you, had a, you have a, a, a long-running relationship now with Tim Burton and Johnny Depp. Yeah. yeah, and that started, that started with, with which film? Edward Scissorhands. So I met them both on that movie. I probably wouldn't have gotten the movie. Um, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I've, I, I was shocked that I got the job because I hadn't done that many films at the time, and I was really excited to to um, to do it. But um, it was a great. I had a great time on the movie and with, with Tim and with Johnny and we're kind of like, we don't hang out in our spare time together but when we come together to work it's a fun, it's always a fun kind of relationship and it's one of the great things about our job is that, that we do collaborate with, with these directors and, and actors and sort of develop shorthand with them sometimes uh, on different things but you know always challenging yourself to sort of do something you haven't done before with them, which is the big, you know, I think again a misconception that people think, oh well, you know, you, you just automatically do what you do with these people without really cha a, it being a challenge for you as a designer. Just because you know the actor mm -hmm. doesn't mean that that it's easy or that it's that you that you'll do what you've always done with them. It's always a, a fresh, you know, a fresh thought, a fresh idea, and it's the whole idea of it is to be creative and to try to keep challenging that and serving whatever it is that you're working on at the time. But knowing, say, Burton's taste and some of his predilections for, like, I remember you were talking about the big eyes, um, things like that, does that help in, in some sense? Well, I think in Tim's case, Tim is one of the great, you know, graphic designers as a he has a, a phenomenal eye for what's important in a negative space. He, he is not a cluttery kind of guy. So um, I think that he came from animation, and there's elements of animation always, even in his realistic work. So knowing that about him is helpful. I'm not the only person that knows that about him. I think people could figure it out. So it's not like there's some magic thing between, between him and I. We just you know, hit it off and laugh at the same things, which I think is really important. I was asked to do Who Framed Roger Rabbit because it was a tiny little film that they were going to, and it was basically in England. And um, it kind of got bigger and bigger. They delayed it, and it's the only time I've ever been put on a, um, what do they call it? You know, they give you a retainer. Mm. They gave me a retainer because they pushed the shoot for two months or something. So I just carried on researching. It was so nice. And um, so that was sort of the beginning on my own. And then with Stephen um, uh, directing, I did uh, the first film I did with him was um, Saving Pri Private Ryan, which was another kind of totally ridiculous thought that I had, which was I thought, oh, uniforms. It's so easy. It's like really easy. It's just uniforms. And my father is a, was a military man. And I remember ringing him up and I go, OK, so we're gonna do the, I'm going to do this film about the second one. You know, and um, I said it'd be really easy. You know, I wouldn't need too much time or anything. <laughs> totally ridiculous. I was working on a film actually with with Jane Fonda. I was very young, 
and a military advisor came, it was called the Dollmaker, and I was told that I had a patch upside down. And they had already filmed the, the scene. And there was this gentleman called Johnny Napolitano, and he knew everything, everything. And I called him, and I was in a small town, and it was cold, and he answered, and I said, he's got his patch up, upside down. They're gonna, what, I, I, we can't afford to reshoot it. And he's, he's making a scene, he said, don't worry, it just means his son died. <laughs> you know? and, I, and I went back, I said, this is an extremely important character point. You know, so yes, you need it, but there's a time to close the books. There is a time to do that, and we sit here, and we're we're all costume designers, and 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 you mentioned Anthony Powell, and he, and he looked at my work, and he helped me, and we're nothing without the other designers that say, here, read this script, it's yours. Everybody helped me. Everybody tried to clean me up, and and. The actors, the designers, and what's different right now is that we talk to each other. We are a community now, and we hope that that's what we're going to push forward. If I'm doing a costume and I think that that costume is going to stand by itself without an actor, and I've overdesigned, which does happen, uh, I, I can, we can talk about it, and and that's gold. That's gold. Did you guys used to work together? No. no. I've worked with Julie. Yeah. I, yeah, I helped her as an assistant in New York when I started out. That's incredible. It's we a, talked it's about a jewelry network. a lot. We did. But you could tell Less about Colleen. You could tell <laughs> because Colleen saw, and she saw in an independent way. And you have a choice at that point. Do you hide your, at that time, a Filofax? Do you leave out the best fabric store? Or are you excited that we are going to be a community of people who know how to design costumes? And that does win out. Now, can any of you go and see a film without noticing the costumes? Just for fun? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Like, what's the last film that you saw and you didn't pay attention to the costumes? The Bond movie. I mean, I like the costumes, but it didn't get in the way like I wasn't obsessing about them or anything. I think the only time I really kind of get kind of eh is when I think they're quite, they're wrong. Mm -hmm. And then I feel kind of distracted by it. Mm -hmm. But I get more distracted by hair. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> or a really bad wig than I do about yeah. costumes any day I of the week. I think it's really terrible when you're watching a film and you can't work out whether it's modern or period. That's when it really distracts me. I can't work out whether they've done period really badly or with it, you know, I find that really distracting. I mean, but don't you think it affects relationships? I now think back when in the middle of a love scene, I noticed that the clock was wrong. Now, if I hadn't noticed that, Colleen, come on. I could have, it could have worked out that night. <laughs> Were you talking about somebody that broke up with you because well, of... Well, I don't think that was the reason. It could have been the excuse. <laughs> but in all seriousness, something happens with us as designers not to go off the road a bit, but we do miss birthdays. We do, we miss family things. We're on that set and something happens and it is, we've talked about this many times, and there is a family there. And it does end, but at that moment, you forget what time it is. Your jobs take you away from your home and your families a lot. How do you all cope with that? I think it's really hard. Um, we are used to it, I suppose, but um, and as you know, as we were talking, you know, you are so committed to the job that you, I mean, you realize most of the time uh, at the end, but not when it's happening. I mean, I think when it's happening, you you get with the flow, and then you know, suddenly the movie finishes, and you think, my God, I haven't called my mom, I haven't called my partner, uh, where are my dogs? You know, all these sort of things. But I always think films are somewhere between. Um, a war, when you go off to do a film, it's somewhere between a war and a circus. Mm -hmm. It's the discipline of a war yes. and it's the chaos and the creativity of a circus. Yes. And it's, it's, it's always, you know it's only for this limited time. So, if, you know, you always have that discipline in your head, don't you? And you kind of, you, you just, that becomes the priority of that moment. And uh, you're right, everything else does take it slightly. 
It's a balance, isn't it? It's a difficult balance. Uh, and you make your own family in a funny you way do. on a film. Oh, you know, you your do. crew and other people on the team that you're, you know, that you're getting up at four in the morning with and seeing till nine at night. And, you know, you have, you kind of have a sort of circus-like dysfunctional kind of family that sort of doesn't replace your own family, but, but it, it grows, you know. Because of the hours and because of birthdays that are celebrated on the set. And then maybe one night you come home and you wonder why somebody doesn't call you back when you haven't returned their call. But I have a recurring nightmare and I don't have children, but it's dress rehearsal and I can't find my baby. <laughs> you know, and that says a lot. I didn't make that one up. I think also talking about, talking about fa the families you create, you create when you shoot a film, I think is really amazing that you, you have a lot of good time with, with the crew and then the f movie finish. And maybe you don't see that people for three years or four years and then you suddenly see them again. Mm -hmm. And it's like if you saw them yesterday. Yeah. It's so fascinating. Mm -hmm. But you yeah. always make a couple of new friends, don't That's you, well, on a yeah. film yeah. that, you know, it grows, it kind of ebb and flow. And, and I'm wondering if you guys can remember, and I'm sure you can, a particular costume disaster that happened during your career? I have to say that's my least favorite question I ever get <laughs> asked because I try to forget those things. So. I don't really have one, sorry. How about a happy accident? Well, a happy accident for me was uh, at, during the prep of Boogie Nights. Uh, there was a place in the Midwest. Do you remember Hullabaloo? Yeah. Used sure. to be? And Lewis. they sent me Lewis. to Hullabaloo and it was all dead stock that had yeah. never been sold from the 70s. And I think I spent $12,000 just to get as much stuff as I thought could, I could use. And so much of the, I even got roller skates with red Easy loose sight. We, uh, uh, with loose sight wheels for Roller Girl. And yeah, the clothes went magically on all the principles. Which film was this for? Boogie Nights. So, you know, crazy things with details on the yokes that I was like, oh, this is a great piece. I hope it fits somebody. Well, it, most of them just happened to be the owner of the nightclub size. And, and, and then John C. Riley somehow fit into these great pants that had never been worn by anybody else. And so it, it was a happy accident to have gone to Hullabaloo because so many iconic pieces in that film came from that trip. Sometimes you'll find a garment that you know should never have been made. And it, it, it might not be yours, hopefully, but you'll see that it might have been someone that it was their only chance to show everything they know. Everything. Not only does it have a certain sleeve, but it has two different skirts, and it has a belt and a tie, and everything is there. So what you do, what, what, some, what, what I love about that, is you find the person who doesn't believe that character, doesn't believe that they're gonna have another chance to be seen. And that's when that costume becomes clothing. And that's a gold mine in search of other people's eccentricities. How, if you, if you weren't a costume designer, would there be another task that you'd perform on a movie set, or would you rather have a career in another field entirely? Um, I think I will have a career somewhere else. Um, I can't see myself doing any other thing than costumes at this moment. I don't know. I don't think I have got... Um, I, I, know how to ask, I know how to say things through the costumes, I think, or I'll try to, but I don't think I will be able to write or to direct or to act or, you know, um, I think in a way, uh, costume design fulfilled my, you know, my, my desire to be in this business. And at the same time, I think every day, especially when I'm shooting, is what can I do to get out of here? <laughs> if, I, if I, you know, become a farmer, wouldn't it be better, you know, I think, but I think it probably happens to all of us, no, somehow. Well, I think we should have a company called In Retrospect. <laughs> we have a corrective memories. You, you, you want it so badly, you start it, then you hit the messy middle, and then at the end, you're so happy, and three days later, you wonder, am I going to get another job? Mm, you know? Yeah. So do you, do, I, do you guys that. ever get, like, afraid that you, your success is something that might vanish and your, your creativity would vanish? Mm -hmm. Every 10 minutes, <laughs> maybe before this started. 
<laughs> I think you never know. It's a very strange business we're in, and, and it, it comes and it goes, and you can't ever, ever know what's next. And it's scary sometimes. Do you wonder if, do you ever have any sense of being able to top yourself in any sense? Is that ever a concern? As in kill yourself, top <laughs> yourself? <laughs> 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 like if you you know if you've, if you've got a you know one spectacular costumes like you all have brought here today, um, do you ever think oh what if I can't do that again? Not really because it depends on on what film you're working on. Each time you 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 go to a film and you're going to do the costumes for that film, and you may have done good costumes for this film that was current at the moment, but then the next film that comes along could be a completely different medium, completely different thing, and and the work will be just as hard. It doesn't mean just because it's not spectacular that it hasn't been hard. But, but, but that's a very important thing. You know, what is a great costume? I mean, an actor has to wear that costume. A director directs the scene. Hopefully, when someone who's seen your film remembers it, they remember the whole picture, and they remember something that, that they could connect to. In a fitting, we've all experienced this, when someone puts on a costume, a period costume, and they start to cry because it reminds somebody, it reminds them of somebody in their family, somebody from a different time, somebody, a picture that they saw. And that, those are moments that you want to have again. Yeah, I was going to ask all of you if there's, a, if there's an actor or actress that you've most enjoyed collaborating with in terms of costumes and maybe a, an anecdote from, like as Julie says, a, an actor crying when putting on a gown, maybe not uh, that I know, No, but, but that, that could also be because they didn't like it. I <laughs> tend to romanticize those moments, so you know. Or, my God, I don't like it. You know, you have You to. are a storyteller. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't know if I really, if I can really think of the answer to that question, but there's a kind of tangentially connected question, which is that one of the formative relationships of, for me and learning about costume design has been to work with Mike Lee which came about through Lindy Hemming and when you work on a Mike Lee film what you, you don't have a script so all the all the kind of relations are kind of backwards and what happens is that you interview the actor about their character and then you make a costume based on the information you've learned about the character from the actor and so that's a really interesting collaboration because it means that there's no other thing outside of the relationship. So you're talking to the, to the actor about the character and that defines what the costume is going to be. There's no kind of script to refer to. I mean, obviously there's a director to refer to, but the primary thing is that, that relationship. And I think that's formative for me because it's really, really brings you back to the character and, and the way, and the, the tiny details that could then make that character sing, as you say, or can make it work as a, full, as a rounded, costume? Well, I think, you know, it's very difficult for me to answer that because I think actors uh, and um, normally, um, in a way, you know, what they are very selfish in the way that they want to get you to create, you know, their costume to be the character. Then I think for me, you know, a good relationship with an actor is when you, when you have this communication and you finally find, you know, the costume that can define, you know, the character they're going to play. And I mean, you know, you have, I mean, in this late movie, I have a lot, you know, for example, Hugh Jackman was great. I mean, it was really, really nice to work with him. As uh, people would say, I mean, my grandmother would have said he was a gentleman. Really, really nice in, in every sense. I mean, it was a pleasure to work with him. Uh, but, you know, I mean, sometimes you have actors or actresses that, you, you know, you don't clip at all. Then, you know, and that's, that's a disaster. But, you know, that's part of our life, I suppose. And you've had lots of collaborations, films with actors. For sure. I think that, for me, one of the most interesting elements of, and misconceptions about actors and the collaborations that we have with them is that some of the most amazing actors I've worked with put on their costume and don't even look in the mirror right yes. away. They walk around in it and they feel the costume and that there's something almost visceral about them sort of feeling what that is, mm -hmm. as opposed to the conception that they're glued to the mirror for um, you know hours on end, which maybe later on in their room they are. I don't know, but but really it's not really 
that it's not a vanity driven job necessarily costume design it's more like that they feel right with what they have and the things that they have yeah it's it's they connect with clothes and sometimes it's with the shape of a coat or it's with a you know and many different actors i've worked with have had it i don't have a specific and the same thing with women some of the most kind of glamorous like very uh, you know, unexpected women don't really look at themselves in the mirror. They don't want to be kind of hung up by that right away. They want to do other things. And then it's also interesting that sometimes the people that sort of haven't got a sense of achievement as an actor are, are, are very vulnerable that way, that they look in the mirror the whole time and they don't f feel anything. And it's very, you kind of, as a, as a costume designer, you have to bring out into them the feeling that they're okay, that it's, that it's good, that they're going to do fine. And you have to really support them and the, and the journey they're making. And I think that that's something that you know, takes place with us in the fitting room with the actor, usually just one-on-one, -on -one, maybe with one other person in the room. But you're not, it's not that you're kind of there having you know, oh, we created the character just now. It's sort of a, <laughs> no, and they it's don't. sort of a journey. Many actors, as, as you said, they they don't look in the mirror. They they feel it. They become it. And for someone like myself, when I started, the senior actors were ready to talk. They were ready to tell stories. So, I was just beginning, and you work with someone like Marlon Brando, who says, "Come here, look again," and Betty Davis, who would go. She didn't like my stories. Will this take long? But, but you watched what, how they worked. Um, Henry Fonda, uh, you were able to be in the dressing room and see what choices they made. And that's where I certainly learned with the director that you go back to that written page, that that's it, that you are there to make those words come to life, to aid and abet. And those good, those extraordinary actors will just stand, you know, and not Robert De Niro, and just just stand, and you watch them become that person. I think actually, just when Colleen was saying, I love that thing when um, the actor, when it's the, the costume is in a, a form close to completeness. Um, in the process, and they look at themselves in the mirror, and there's, there's just an immediate. Uh, kind of, um, I don't know how to say it, it would be like um, the pennies dropped as regards to the depiction of the character. And it, it you know, because the, the costume department is always the first port of call, really. Mm -hmm. So they often come to us with no opinions or some or a lot. And mm -hmm. so, um, you know, it's you sort of navigate yourself around that. But I think that thing, especially when you're possibly dealing with um, uh, depicting, like in Lincoln, depicting people who existed, so therefore it's a, there's an existing image. And then, then those pieces all get put together and then they look, you, you can tell whether you, you're okay by you can see the um, reaction in their face. You know, there's a sense of place or being about that. I think that's really, I, was, I, I love the fitting room, I love the, the sort of sacred, um, you know, as Colleen was saying, that sort of intimate relationship because we're, you know, doing what Colleen said, building up trust and nurturing and being a bit of an ambassador with them and um, if there are different thoughts about where they want to go. So um, I personally do love that process, that, that, that time. Um, it's very, it is, it's, it's quite special. Mm. Now, I wonder if you have time for hobbies, any of you? Oh, yeah. Oh, sure. Uh, as a matter of fact, I look forward to the time that I'm off so I can take advantage of all of them. You know, um, uh, I've landscaped the front and the back of my house. Um, redid my kitchen myself, uh, except for cutting the marble. I didn't cut the marble for the countertops, but all the cabinets I did. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's how, I, and I really don't have time for all the stuff that I want to try to do. And it goes back to someone gave me advice really early in my career about, because I was doing a lot of different things. I was kind of 
all over the place with what I was doing. And someone told me, you know, you should really probably settle on one thing f because otherwise you're going to kind of be a jack of all trades that doesn't do one thing very career. well. Yeah. And so I think that was really good advice to do because then the rest of it can be hobbies and a lot of this stuff I would never even want to turn into a business or anything like that. It's just for me, just for, to feel a sense of accomplishment. I'm very project oriented, I'm sure as we all are, but uh, so, and there's art projects that are half finished because, you know, in this business you can get a call on Friday and we need you in Detroit on Monday or something. So, um, there's just, it's, it's quite a full fun time when I'm off with all the things that I can do. I don't, I'm not somebody who chafes at being, having some time off. Mm. I kind of like it. I love to have time off as well. And I love to, when I finish movies, I, a movie, I, the only thing I want to, to be is like to have a domestic life. Mm. I love to come back home, cook, clean, walk my dogs, uh, go to, you know, go I've to the... I've never loved to clean. <laughs> well, I don't, but you know, yeah. you have to say something. <laughs> and, yeah. you know, walk my dogs, I, I, I love it, you know, I think that's one of the pleasures of this business is that you can stop and then, you know, sort of have a completely, completely different life, Some, you know, suddenly. I love to read as well, then, you know, I, I, I cannot concentrate in any book if it's not related to the movie when I'm doing a movie, I mean, if it, if it is related to the movie, yes, then I will read a lot. But if, if not, uh, when I'm, you know, I mean, I love to read when I'm free, you know. You know, I own a house and there's always, like when I come home, I always look at it in a new light. And so it's been, um, it's been torn apart and put back together many times, like in small and large things. But I think that one of the things I like about, about my job is traveling, and, and traveling is also a hobby that I enjoy. So I do that, and I have a, um, grandchildren, so, so they're, I hate, they aren't really a hobby, but it's a nice yeah. diversion to get to spend time with them when I'm not, you know, working on a 12-hour, 18-hour day, so. Where do you like to travel? Anywhere. Anywhere, yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty, I, I, I like an adventure. Yeah, children is what I do when I'm not working. <laughs> I try and do it as full time as possible whenever I'm not working to make up for the fact that sometimes I go and do films that take me away for, you know, 18 hours a day. Um, so yes, they're, they're young, so I try and look after them a lot, five and seven. Well, I, I look at you with such envy because somehow I never have known how not to work. I'm still redesigning films that are already finished. <laughs> I borrow, as I say, you meet somebody and they describe something. I can't trade clothing off the streets anymore. You know, you have to put them in plastic bags and your crew doesn't want to do that. But I wish, I wish I could stop working even when I don't have a job. Somebody will have a story. Somebody who will say that where I live is filled with too many things, with, with add to, as Colleen knows. And, but it is the depository of what other people can't part with. The, the uh, uniform, the Navy uniform, when the wife, he's just died, and she came over and she said, take this. You know, I was really in the Navy. He was in the reserve, you know? And you have this collection. So I'm, I read scripts. I, I can't stop working. So perhaps after this, maybe I could learn a little bit, huh? Well, you do all your beautiful displays and sort of things in your home. Well, I have certain. That are, are I, very I, artistic. I, I do. And you're I, very humble. You're one of the best artists Thank as you. an artist that I know. Thank you, Colin. Julie's studio world. is legendary. Yeah. Well, I do think that that's what taught me. And that is that I do feel that what other people leave behind are really the things that they're embarrassed to keep. And if you My do society. that. My <laughs> society. But if, if you do that, if you do that and you 
have these, it does make you a better costume designer. It, because it is about memories, and it isn't just about the moment. And if maybe it's time that you know one moves forward on that, but there are funny little dolls and stuffed animals and old pieces of clothing that no one could throw away. So they do end up at, at, my, at my place. OK, they do. Yeah. But uh, they are used. It does seem, and um, I think some of us have talked about this before, is there is a, an increased interest in what it is that you do and in your career. And it seems like for all of your films, you're now called upon to talk to a lot of reporters, to attend events such as this, and go into great detail about your work. But, that, you, but that's because that? it was, you know, is it costume becoming fashion or fashion becoming costume? Mm -hmm. And there is the turnover now uh, of uh, fashion. It used to be certain seasons or windows would change uh, and they would take more time in doing that. And now it's very rapid. Mm -hmm. So the clothes are out there and glamour is accessible as we mentioned before. It's also the digital media and the kind of people on the streets interest in, in um, clothes that, and costume that aren't necessarily the fashion press or the, mm -hmm. you know, that, that the, the guys on the street see a movie and they, they go, wow, you know, how did that happen? You know, the mm -hmm. tweeters who, you know, now when you do a premiere or something, there's not only the, you know, the photographs and, and all that, there is a line of 20, 20 somethings tweeting away who have a lot of, of excitement about costume and mm -hmm. a, the whole other part of filmmaking that's really, that's kind of cool because they're just talking among themselves, but it gets excitement going about a movie and, and things in it. And yeah. so it, it can be, you know, I know it can be a negative thing too, but in, in fact, it's kind of, it's kind of nice because it opens the doors to, to a lot of, you know, a lot of people that wouldn't necessarily be interested in what we do. And contemporary photography, it's not, it's not just glamour. You look at the great photographers, whether it's, it's Arbus or Leibowitz or Win Winograd. You, there are books out there, pages and pages, again, of people who are part of, not necessarily in the top tier of, of what that moment of beauty is. I think also it has to do something, and uh, um, I hope it's so, the uniqueness of what we do into the, into the, you know, the work of, of, of clothes. I mean, we do a unique work. You know, like really like, you know, we are probably the, the end of this, you know, handcraft people that do, you know, I mean, nowadays it's like, you know, the clothes are so kind of like mass produced. Everywhere is the same. I mean, you go to Los Angeles and you can buy the same skirt that you can buy in Madrid or you can buy in, in, in Hong Kong. And then what we do is like unique. I mean, you know, we assist to see in a way, and I think that's tragic, the death of so many professions, you know, the old lady who, 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 did, who did plume, pl plumes, you say? Yeah. Uh, the, you know, the old plumists. The, I mean, you know, you go, you, you are working in a movie and you suddenly think, oh, I remember that old lady that she used to embroider everything so beautifully. You run to her, her workshop mm -hmm. and it doesn't exist anymore. And I see that every day happening. And I think mm -hmm. that kind of uniqueness is what attracts people nowadays, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, you know, when you do, you do in, a, in, 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 in a costume, like an embroidery, for example, you find people around saying, oh, I'm probably in my grandmother's time. Nobody would have said, oh, for an embroidery. That was a normal thing, you know. Yeah. Then, you know, I think that's one of the reasons as well, probably. And do you have any regrets, any of you? Many. <laughs> many. 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 My, my career was my family. It is my family. And at this point, uh, well, I guess I could get stand-ins calling. <laughs> I could borrow your family for the holidays. <laughs> but no, but, but you do miss that. You do. But, but no regrets. I mean, it was, it's, it's extraordinary. It continues to be. I think we are, I mean, you know, we are very fortunate to work in this business. I mean, you know, it's amazing that we are working here, really. Mm -hmm. I, I, that's what I think every day when I work. Yeah. You know, I think it's no regrets. Well, a lot of regrets, but no about movies. Yeah. <laughs> no about movies. Well, in well, your, your personal life, any regrets? I don't know. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and 
And when you're called upon to do press, do you find it um, a, a drain to have to think back to the two years before when you were working on that film and remember all that? Or are you now getting attuned to the fact that you're going to have to be talking about your films to a lot of What press? I always find is I've never got any, I never archive anything from the film. So I never have anything to hand. Same, nothing. <laughs> But and that becomes more and more important I'll now, sit on it? a bus stop if somebody would like to talk about a film. You know, so, yes. I, but, okay. I find sometimes that I'm talking to people for press that um, have done no prep for the conversation. And I know they probably are covering a million things, but I find it a little bit insulting that they have no kind of foreknowledge I, and I can tell a lot of times they haven't even seen the movie I'm talking about. And sometimes they say, have you seen the movie yet? Like, and they go, no. And I was like, why are you asking me? How can you even, like, you know, I feel bad for them. I mean, they shouldn't really be doing that, but I'm sure it's, you know, it's the way it rolls. But, but I find that difficult with press, and I try to fill in the spaces. But, um, but that part of it is, is a bit trying, I'm sure. You know, for anybody that's been on a press junket, it is just amazing how everyone asks the same questions. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, it gives you insight to what actors, you know, must have to endure mm -hmm. in their work, you know. Would you have any uh, one or two words of advice for anyone wanting a career in the field? Be careful who you walk by. <laughs> look, <laughs> look, look again. Be nice to everyone on the crew the people just starting because they will be the studio heads. <laughs> but be fair in how you define beauty because some people feel like a million bucks and you'll walk right by them.